So hello everyone and welcome to The Way Forward. We're gonna be talking about global supply chains and leadership with two of the great leaders of um, America's iconic manufacturing companies. Um, and I'll introduce our guests first and then go to the questions. But while we do this, I want you to remember that you can sign uh, on to the Q&A and list your questions for our two guests and we'll try and get to them as we go. So let me introduce our uh, two CEOs who are with us today. Inon Kreis is the chairman and CEO of Mattel. He became uh, CEO in April of 2018. And I can't imagine there's a household in America that doesn't have Mattel's brands. Names like Barbie, Hot Wheels, Fisher Price, American Girl, Thomas and Friends, and Mega. I have a piece of Mega right behind me. And Mattel sells products in probably 150 countries. Before Mattel, Inon was chairman and CEO of Maker Studios, which is a leader in short form video content. He was chairman and CEO of the Endemol Group, which is the world's largest independent television production company. Some of you may know Big Brother and Deal or No Deal. And he was also chairman and CEO of Fox Kids Europe. He serves on the board of Warner Music and he's a member of the Business Roundtable. He was born and raised in Israel. You'll hear it in his accent. Inon received an undergraduate degree from Tel Aviv University and an MBA from UCLA Anderson School of Management. A second guest who's also actually on the Business Roundtable is Jim Lurie, who's president and CEO of Stanley Black & Decker. He joined the company, which was then called Stanley Works, as the chief financial officer as a CFO in 1999. He became CEO, chief executive officer in 2016. Stanley Black & Decker has employees in approximately 60 countries, close to 60,000 employees around the world. You'll also know these names. There isn't a household in America that doesn't have these brands like Black & Decker, Bostitch, Craftsman, DeWalt, Paycom, Irwin, Lennox, Porter Cable, and Stanley. It also includes the world's second largest commercial electronic security company, and it operates a leading engineering fastening business. Before Black & Decker, Jim spent 19 years with GE. He serves as a director of Whirlpool, and of the National Association of Manufacturers in Hartford Hospital. He's a graduate of Union College. Joining me today in asking the questions is our Dean of the School of Business, my colleague, Dr. Matt O'Connor. And again, go to the Q&A uh, to ask uh, your questions and we'll do our very best to get there. So I'm gonna start with uh, Jim and Inon, maybe you start Jim. Talk about some of those iconic brands that I mentioned and talk about the global scale of your business. Just give us a sense of it. Well, if you can imagine uh, managing 60,000 employees, approximately half of them, so 30,000 employees in manufacturing and distribution uh, in all those countries around the world, Asia, Europe, uh, the United States, Mexico, uh, et cetera, Latin America. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an incredibly uh, complex supply chain, you know, the you know, vendors in the thousands um, and SKU or SKUs in, you know, probably close to 100,000 SKUs that we're managing. So an incredible amount of complexity at a time, you know, when, uh, when supply chains have been put under great stress and strain and, and uh, we're, very, uh, we're very pleased that we've been able to come through this pandemic so far with minimum disruption in the supply chain, but I, I, it's kind of like a three-star Michelin restaurant where the output, you know, is a beautiful thing, but the uh, the process, the sausage making of actually keeping the you know the things running, and effectively has been one of the most challenging uh, experiences of uh, of my life. And and Inon, you talk about um, making those Barbies or the scale of your operation and how. Um, you, you've really managed this global crisis. 
Uh, sure, Mattel is uh, the owner of one of the strongest portfolios of children and family entertainment franchises uh, in the world. Uh, our iconic brands have uh, been inspiring generations of consumers and, and have deep emotional connections with uh, a large base with children all over the world. Uh, our brand's portfolio have uh, a range of categories, including dolls, vehicles, infant, toddler, and preschool, action figures, games, construction, construction plush, and um, include many, many of um, the brands that every, everyone knows that, uh, just as you said, uh, Judy, from Barbie, Hot Wheels, Fisher Price, Thomas and Friends, American Girl, Mega, Uno. We also have some uh, brands that are not as active today, but still very popular, like Masters of the Universe, Monster High, Polly Pocket, Magic 8-Ball, Pictionary, Barney, Bob the Builder, and Angelina Ballerina. And of course, we also partner with some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, entertainment companies that own major brands as Disney, which owns Toy Story 4, uh, and Cars, Universal that owns Jurassic World, uh, WWE, as well as uh, Baby Yoda. So uh, our product offering canvases many of the most popular brands um, in, 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 in the world. So I'm sure that you have some Black & Decker drills in your home and Jim Lurie has a few Barbies in his home with his four daughters. Yeah, and with my 24 year old, I think we, we, she was big in Polly Pocket, so it was a while back, but uh, we have those too. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so I know that both of you entered your companies when, when you first got there and, and, and really assessed them and restructured. And some of, some of what you're doing is still in that process of restructuring. So talk, give us that big picture analysis of what you saw when you first became the CEO and then uh, what you're doing or did to restructure given the fact that your tenures are a bit different. I don't know, Inon, if you want to start. Sure, uh, Mattel is one of the most iconic companies in corporate America, maybe in the world, uh, with 75 years of uh, legacy and heritage um, and home for some of these greatest uh, brands that I mentioned just before. So uh, coming into Mattel was, um, was a real opportunity as well as a challenge to, um, to drive a turnaround. Uh, the first priority was to develop a clear and very focused strategy to transform Mattel into an IP-driven, high-performing toy company. Historically, Mattel used to think of itself as a toy manufacturing company, and our journey was about transforming it to focus on the, the brands that we own, being IP-driven, high-performing toy company. Since we the, have some, some folks that come from different backgrounds, I'll just interject IP, intellectual property. Thank you, that's right, uh, intellectual property. Uh, the focus in, in the short to midterm was to restore profitability uh, by reshaping our operations and regain our revenue growth uh, through driving our power brands and expanding our brand portfolio. And in the mid to long term, our focus was to capture the full value of, of, of our catalog. Over the past two years, we developed a flexible and results oriented organization we restructured the company around a category management approach rather than focus on individual brands. We stimulated innovation across all categories. We turned our supply chain organization uh, and global scale to be a competitive advantage. We established a global commercial organization to accelerate growth across all regions and throughout our retail network, which today spans more than 450,000 doors worldwide that sell our product. We positioned the company to capture growth in the shift to e-commerce uh, as consumers look for innovative uh, ways to, 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 to buy the favorite product. Uh, and we also expect to benefit from a, a major restructuring in a cost savings program that is on track to exceed $1 billion um, within uh, a period uh, that is slightly over two years, but over a billion dollars of cost savings. And in the process, we are on track to grow our profitability fivefold in the last three years. In the last nine quarters, we, continue, we improved um, uh, gross margin, which is a key measure of performance for the company. We uh, 
just in the last uh, third quarter of the year, our most recent quarter that we just announced, we had the highest growth that the company had in any quarter over the last 10 years. And, um, you know, with all of that, you can see the trajectory of, of our performance. Yeah. But the main thing uh, is really that our brands resonate and, and uh, really touch the hearts of many consumers all over the world. And this is the foundation for our, for our business. And as long as we are able to do that, good things will happen. Okay, so we're gonna come back to a couple of things that you said along the way around the transition to IP and also the direct to consumer electronic distribution. But Jim, back to you on this question of how you came in and saw the need for restructuring. Okay, am I, am I on mute? I see I'm mute. No, you're good. Okay, so the, the parallels between Eon's story and, and ours are, are actually quite remarkable. And, you know, we, it took us 153 years to um, reach a little over 2 billion in revenue. Uh, when I came in 1999, we had to close, and if you can imagine 40 plants and 40 distribution centers for a company that size. So you can imagine how bloated the cost structure was uh, at the time. We did that over a three year period. And then we started transforming the portfolio. When I started, the tool business was Stanley, period. 600 million in, in sales. And over the success of 20 years, we've grown it to $10 billion and we've, we've become the leading tool company uh, in the world with all those great brands that you were talking about before, Judy. Uh, one, of our, one of the benchmarks along the way was the uh, in 08, 09 uh, recession, which took our revenues down about 20 to 30% during that time frame as a company. And we went through another brutal restructuring at that point in time, but we emerged in 2009 much stronger with a acquisition of Black & Decker. So the, they were both $4 billion companies at the time. We created an $8 billion company with the merger of those two uh, organizations. And we started to have a really powerful stable of brands. Can you imagine DeWalt? Black and Decker, Stanley, on all the other, a lot of the other ones you mentioned, they were all uh, part of that. And so we spent the next uh, three or four years integrating that, and it was a fabulous uh, value creation story for our shareholders. And and then we started a pursuit of organic growth and you know margin accretion over the successive years, uh, ending up in you know 2015, 2016 with a, a tremendous growth story. By then we were 11 billion in revenue and, and uh, you know, the shareholder value creation over that time frame was, was approximately maybe seven or eight times um, what the, uh, the Stanley share, uh, share, share of value was in the turn of the century. So we had a great, you know, kind of looking back, we had this great story. Uh, we grown from 2 billion to, um, to 11 and so forth. Um, when I, so when I took over, I looked back and I said, you know, we've had a wonderful run. The stock price appreciation has been great. We've been on a, essentially a restructuring and financial treadmill. Um, but I also was looking ahead to what my legacy would be. And I, I realized that things were changing in the corporate world as it relates to social responsibility. Uh, the accelerating pace of technological change was becoming very challenging for, a, you know, was essentially a mechanical and you know, electrification kind of a company, but not a sophisticated software uh, type of a company. And, and so when I took the job in 2016, I decided to uh, set up three essential elements to the strategy. The first was to continue the, the uh, top quartile financial performance that we had achieved over that time frame. The second was to become known as one of the world's great innovative companies. And that's a lofty, it's a lofty goal, but it's one that I figured if we never got there, but we got 80% of the way there, that it would be a huge uh, benefit uh, and, for our, and help us be sustainable into the future. And the third one was to elevate our commitment to corporate social responsibility. And as it turns out, those three elements um, interact and resonate uh, so effectively that really one plus one plus one is not three, it's more like five. And the inspiration and the engagement that it drives with the employee base uh, and the, the, the benefit to the employer brand that we've enjoyed from all that has been great. And so we just finished up uh, similar to Enon with a best quarter in our history. 
Uh, it was the first time we'd broken through 15% operating margin. We got all the way up to 17.7%. We had another great growth quarter. Uh, and, uh, you know, the future is very bright because we have three or four billion dollars of uh, growth and issues ahead of us now. And we're a $14 billion company today. I wanted to uh, jump in. You, you both talked a little bit about uh, having uh, some really good quarters uh, recently. Um, but just in terms of the impact of COVID, any products or product lines that are not doing so well in, uh, under, under COVID and any surprises there, anything that surprised you in terms of uh, you know, uh, revenue related to products and COVID? So uh, Anand, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so what we're seeing is that the toy industry as a whole is doing very well with kids staying at home, parents prioritize, spend on their children, and, and toys uh, proving to be a strategic category for, for retailers. Within that environment, our properties are thriving. Um, and the, you know, we're seeing it across the portfolio, but uh, the, the one to mention is Barbie, which has done exceptionally well mm -hmm. and continues to resonate uh, with consumers. It, it uh, gross revenues were up 30% in the quarter and retail sales were up 50%, which really speaks to the strength of um, an ongoing momentum of this incredible franchise, franchise which is 62 years old. Uh, it, it's a combination of great product innovation, uh, design-led design -led approach, cultural relevance and very active demand creation. Barbie today um, is very much uh, a cultural phenomena. Um, it, it has societal impact. It's, it's driving diversity, inclusivity, and purposeful play. It's, um, it's been a multi-year journey with evolving body shapes, uh, working on ethnicity, storytelling, and product innovation. And we very much reframe the conversation around Barbie to be, to be very purposeful. And this is um, resonating with consumers, resonating with parents. And it's just great to see that Barbie, um, 62 years old, uh, becoming the number one property overall globally uh, in the third quarter, not just across the world, but across the entire industry. Barbie also had its highest quality growth um, uh, in, in, uh, that, that we have on record going back over 20 years. Even the Barbie dream house, which is typically an item that we sell over the Christmas holiday, has been the number three most selling item uh, in the industry uh, in the quarter. So a lot to be proud of um, and a lot to, uh, to see ahead of uh, Barbie with a lot of momentum, uh, which, is, which is very exciting. We're also seeing um, a lot of demand for American Girl product, which, um, which, is, doing, uh, which is gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, vehicles category led by Hot Wheels is growing strongly. Uh, Hot Wheels and Matchbox are doing very well. And games, uh, we just had its seventh consecutive quarter of year-over-year -year growth. Consumer demand is strong. Um, retail sales are up double digit in the third quarter. And Uno continuing to perform exceptionally well, remaining the number one item in the entire games and puzzles category in the U.S. Uh, year yeah. to date. So a lot to be uh, excited by, and don't forget Baby Yoda, which uh, also was the number one plush item in the US uh, year to date. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's been the number one since the day we launched it and been a global hit. So uh, lots of exciting product to, um, to be excited by. Great, thanks Anand. Jim, what about for Stanley Black & Decker? Any, uh, any surprises then overall, what's, what's performed well and what hasn't uh, since uh, the onset of COVID? Well, we probably had more surprises and more volatility this year than in, in any of my 21 years. Um, the, it's probably best to, to kind of just say, tell you how the year kind of play, has played out so far. And so things were normal, you know, January, February uh, seemed pretty normal. And then all of a sudden March with the uh, lockdowns uh, began to, uh, revenue began to tank uh, really pretty much across the, the entire globe. Uh, in April, we had four weeks where we were down 40% uh, in revenue in a row. Uh, and in the third or fourth week of that, we decided to take a billion dollars of cost out of our cost structure because 
we had gotten into an existential moment, you know, when we, when we actually had one investor call and say, if, if revenue goes to zero, how many months can you survive? So, you know, you're in this mode of, uh, you know, you're kind of on the first rung of the, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, existential, um, you know, survival mode. And uh, that lasted about two or three weeks. We, we did a bunch of things, started taking out the costs, shored up our really already strong liquidity. Uh, and then in, in May, all of a sudden, the point of sale at the customer, which had been slightly down, the orders from the end point of sales for the end customer at the cash register of the retailer, the retailers had stopped ordering in April, pretty much. And all of a sudden, the point of sale started going up. One week, it went up 5%, then 10, 15, 20, the next, you know, in successive weeks. And by the fourth week in, it was about 40% higher at the cash register, similar to probably what Enon was experiencing. Uh, and it stayed at that level for a good part of the summer. And now it's kind of come down to about 20% up. Uh, and so in, in May, we had, a, as a management team, had to make a decision to um, invest in about $600 million of inventory uh, to order that inventory on our China plants in particular because of the you know 13 to 14 week cycle time to get the inventory into the into, into the retailers. And we knew that the retailers would start ordering at some point, or at least we thought they would. And so we used our uh, common sense and we went out and we spent 600 million four weeks after we had been worried about the, you know, the liquidity of the company. So it was really an exciting time to manage. But what was surprising is so, you know, when you delve into that point of sale increase, what was surprising is that when people stay at home, uh, number one, they are looking to repurpose their homes. Secondly, uh, they are, many of them are bored and are looking for projects to do. And so what happened was the, the, the woodworking projects in particular went off the charts. So things like sanders, which, you know, don't sell, you know, sell all that, that uh, significantly, were up about five times what the normal volume was. And so there were, there were skews in woodworking. Uh, that, were, that were really hot. And then some uh, other area, the other big area was outdoor products because people were spending a lot of time in their mm -hmm. gardens and, and, and on their, on their land, in the landscape. And so what wasn't doing well were industrial products where um, a lot of factories had shut down and those tools that we provide to industries like automotive and aerospace and so on, you know, were, uh, were not selling very well. That's not a, it wasn't a surprise, but it certainly was an extreme dynamic. So we had one part of the business doing really well. We had another part not doing not so well, but net net uh, things were very positive. And that's how we ended up with the, you know, the great third quarter result. Great. Jim, let me ask you a follow-up question and then I'll, I'll, Anand, I'll ask you the same question, but you mentioned, um, you know, your, your uh, uh, plants in China, give us a little sense, give the students a little sense about where you do produce your products. And, um, and then with, with regards to COVID, has it, has it uh, caused you to begin to rethink, you know, those supply chains and moving any production um, because of COVID? Sure. So we have 10 plants in China. We just closed one. So now we have nine plants. But back in, the, in their uh, peak of the crisis, we had 10, 8,000 employees. And uh, our plants are in, in the Northeast, in the Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen area, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and uh, Suzhou. And so, and a little bit in Guangdong and down in that area. Uh, but no, nothing in the Hubei province, fortunately for us. And so in the end, this is amazing. We track every COVID case that uh, we become aware of. And we, we really focus on making sure that we understand what caused it, how we can help the employees if they or their families if they get it and so on. Um, but in that first wave of COVID with 8,000 employees, we had one case, one case during China, in China. And, and, uh, and that was um, incredible to me, but it was, it was a function of number one, the protections that we put in early on day one, we, the safety of our employees was the number one focus of the company. And that was, enabled us to operate continuously. And, uh, and, and, and that was the second priority to operate continuously. So they you know, can't get one without the other. Um, but China's government also used very strong arm tactics uh, to control the movement of people and the behavior of people during that time frame. When the, uh, when the crisis moved on to, um, 
to Europe and and then subsequently to North America, you know, there, there were there was far more liberty uh, ascribed to the uh, you know to the to the population, and the, the net result is many more cases. We're getting a lot of community spread and 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 so forth during that time frame. But we we took what we learned in China and we applied it in, in everywhere around the world, and that was one of the reasons we were able to keep the supply chain going. Great. And Nan, same, same question. Uh, give the students a little bit of sense of, uh, you know, um, the expanse of your supply chains. And again, um, any plans to diversify those supply chains that are a result of the impact of COVID? Uh, so M Mattel has also a very geographically diverse uh, manufacturing footprint with products being made in, uh, in eight different countries. We, we uh, have a competitive advantage specifically in die cast and fashion doll uh, plants, but we also leverage a network of uh, third party vendors that we work with uh, across the world. Our business is very seasonal, as you would imagine. Uh, most of our sales are in the third and fourth quarter. So you need to manage uh, uh, surge in demand and different, different uh, requirements that might change on short notice. And this is a business that is much more akin to the fashion industry than packaged goods, as might, some people might think. Um, but we turn our supply chain into a competitive advantage that is now driving both bottom line performance, but also top line revenue. And one of the things that, that we've done is, is we look to simplify and rationalize uh, how much and what type of product do we make? and try to focus on productivity and, be, and making sure that what we make actually is profitable and helps the company as a whole drive revenue and profitability. We are now in the middle of what we call a capitalite program. This is a multi-year comprehensive effort to optimize our manufacturing footprint, increase the productivity of our plant infrastructure and drive higher performance uh, across the entire supply chain. That means reducing the number of, uh, of uh, SKUs, um, items that we manufacture, and also um, uh, drive uh, more efficiency. And as part of that, we have closed three factories that we own. We're in the process of closing another one. And in doing that, we're looking to make the organization lighter and being able to more, uh, uh, be able to better respond and have more flexibility in, in the way we make our product, the timing of it, and making sure that we remain competitive, agile, and, uh, and more profitable. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll go now to a couple of questions from the audience. And we have a lot of questions and in the interest of, of capturing as many as possible, I'll ask Jim and Inan to be a bit, um, uh, a, a bit concise in, in your answers. So let me start from uh, Dylan who asked the following question. I'm just looking for his question. And, and the gist of it was, have you had to change how you distribute and sell your products because of COVID? For example, e-commerce, has that had to, do you have to shift towards that to a greater extent now? Um, sorry, this was actually from Austin. H how has it um, affected your uh, distribution plans and channels. And maybe Jim, you start. Um, oh, it it's, is it's a really perceptive question because the answer is definitely. Um, we were very fortunate to have been working 10 years on our e-commerce uh, strategy and execution. So it turns out that we have a 3X uh, advantage in terms of revenue through e-commerce and relationships all over the world with e-commerce players. Uh, that we can now leverage and, and are leveraging and our e-commerce growth is running, you know, 50 to 60 percent this year. We'll have a two billion dollar e-commerce business by the uh, end of the year. And so, you know, part of the, you know, the business being so great, we, we were able to take some more investment uh, and reinvest it in e-commerce. And that's exactly what we're doing. So now we're pursuing a direct to consumer uh, model in China. Uh, working with Alibaba and with uh, Accenture uh, on a big project there where we don't have a lot of market share. We're doing the same thing in India and the same thing in Germany where we're also kind of under indexed and, and, and then we're taking additional dollars and doubling down on our investments in e-commerce in uh, all around the globe in what I call the core e-commerce. Thank you. And, and Inon? 
Yes, same for us. Uh, this is probably the, the most meaningful change in consumer behavior uh, in terms of the increased propensity to shop online and preferring to stay at home and have more flexibility in how you consume and buy product. Uh, we, uh, like Jim, did uh, a lot of work on our e-commerce side. We grew significantly and continued to outpace the industry even when stores reopened. So the, the, the phenomena started where stores were closed, but even where stores reopened, we saw the continuing expansion and growth in e-commerce. It uh, e-commerce grew from a tail more than 50% in the quarter. And at this point, it represents 30% of our global retail sales. American Girl also uh, grew strongly, more than doubled. Uh, uh, it's direct to consumer business, which currently represents more than 50% of, of sales. So uh, large acceleration of uh, online retail, e-commerce, direct to consumer offering. Um, and we expect that to remain a key part of our business going forward. Thank you. And thanks to Dylan for that question. I'm gonna to go to Skylar's question. And I'll, I'll elaborate just a little bit on that. Um, so Skylar is asking, have you thought after the pandemic and the challenges of the multiple complexities of, of your supply chain to move your suppliers, supplier sources? And remember, of course, you, you both know this, you need to get the right inventory at the right time, not too much, and not too little uh, of that, which is of course the, the, the supply chain and logistical problem. So both location and timing of transportation, et cetera. Inon, do you wanna start with that? Yes, that's a very poignant question. Uh, as you pointed out, Judy, this is the core of what we do. Getting that right is key to our success. Uh, it is a combination of, um, of uh, a bit of art and a lot of science, a lot of data analytics, um, and a lot of work to try and anticipate uh, demand in, in, in finding uh, ahead of time how much you need to commit to, to, to manufacture. We work very closely with our retail partners. It is a strong collaboration with all the retailers that we work with to try and fine tune and find the right equation. There's no, there is no magic formula. Uh, we clearly are trying to find ways to shorten the supply time, shorten delivery time, and doing it in a way that is economical. And at this point, um, we're doing well. Our supply chain is performing very well, but it's, it's uh, heading into the uh, fourth quarter. It became um, a lot of a chase, uh, trying to meet the surge in very uh, meaningful, extraordinary demand we're seeing for our product heading into the holiday season. And this remains a key priority for the company. And um, I appreciate the question because it's right on the button. Jim? Yeah, we were shifting our supply chain prior to uh, the pandemic. And we had about $4 billion worth of production in China, you know, for a, for a $10 billion, mostly for a tool business, a $10 billion tool business. So that, that is not uh, something that is sustainable, you know, in the, in the post pandemic or current pandemic world. Uh, and even pre-pandemic, because the customers who are the end users, who are uh, the folks in the, you know, the ordering on e-commerce or whatever, I mean, they want everything today or yesterday at the, at the best case. So the supply chain has to be very agile and you can't have a 13 week lead time coming out of China to service the North American or European markets. Just doesn't, it doesn't work. And so we are very fortunate that we've been working for a couple of years on uh, industry 4.0. And Industry 4.0 is basically the uh, technological revolution in manufacturing. Uh, and so we have many, many different projects in Industry 4.0 that we're able to implement, bringing into plants in the developed countries that are higher labor costs. But this Industry 4.0 uh, technology enables us to take the labor content out and facilitating moves from China and, and uh, other uh, kind of low cost labor countries into the home, you know, home, home, homeland, if you will, uh, where things are sold, and that's a big change that's going on. Within two years, we'll have only about half a billion of export business from China into our other developed countries. I'm going to just do one thing here, and I won't mention the questioner, but this is one question that I do not think our CEOs will answer. 
And the question here is, do either of you have any soft guidance for the future that you are legally allowed to give us, which has not already been announced during your previous earnings report? I think it's safe to say that the answer would be no. Yeah, there's right. a, something called Reg FD that prevents us from doing that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Matt, go for it. Yeah, I um, uh, one of the things we're talking to students about is, uh, you know, the pandemic itself, it's, it's incredibly challenging, but challenges uh, can be turned into opportunities. So we wanted to ask you guys, um, what, what COVID-related challenges have you turned into opportunities at your companies, and which ones do you think are going to be most long-lasting and have the biggest impact? So, Anand, why don't you start? Yeah, I, I would say that in the early part of uh, the disruption, uh, there was significant uncertainty and uh, you know, major retail closure with a third of the stores that sell our product around the world that represent about 30% of our revenues were closed. Uh, so think that you know, about over 150,000 stores being closed that sell your product. That was a significant challenge. Um, that we faced in the, um, uh, in the beginning of the second quarter. And we had to pivot, we had to shift into e-commerce, we had to work uh, very hard to protect our supply chain and find ways to get product to the hands of consumers. We know there is demand, but it was simply hard to, to, to get there. Uh, and as stores reopened, we caught up and being able to supply that demand. And as I mentioned earlier, the shift to online retail and e-commerce was transformative in being able to catch up with the demand and, and reach consumers. Uh, we closed the gap and there we saw the, uh, the, the upswing, such a major upswing from double digit decline to double digit growth from quarter to quarter uh, was significant and uh, what drove our performance um, in the quarter. The other thing that I would say that uh, emerged as, um, as an interesting phenomena is, is the importance of physical play. In the days of uh, COVID where people stay at home and spend so much time in front of computer screens, physical play is important and parents recognize that. And with that, I would add that the, the focus on quality product and trusted brands is now more important than ever where you know, what we make uh, is, is product that touches people's lives and has cultural impact. And it's not about just making a toy and selling it out there. It's about making product that resonate, that have a purpose, that, that, that are there for a reason. And when we make a doll uh, or we make Barbie, we don't call it, you know, a 12 inch doll or an 18 inch doll. We call it Barbie or American Girl or Hot Wheels and each of our brands have a purpose, have a reason, and that is what is driving their success. So I would say that the days of COVID accentuated the uh, focus on quality and, and, and trust. And this is something that as an, organ an organization, as a, as a purpose uh, driven organization, we are putting a lot of effort and a lot of importance on. Great, great. Jim, innovations, you know, that, that came out of your response to COVID and which ones do you think will be most long lasting? Yeah, I mean, that, just before we get into that, the, um, that last point that Enon made uh, resonates completely with uh, us as well. I mean, the, the brands, the purpose, we are for those who make the world, that's our purpose. And uh, when you think about that in relation to the crisis and all the, you know, the the challenges that people face in their personal lives and so on, and, and just being there for those people with, and, and being trusted, it's been so important. Um, the, you know, so many different challenges arose during this crisis, but I, I would say, um, you know, the, the, uh, one of the opportunities that we seized was the idea that we want to come out of this crisis much stronger than we were, and we were strong, you know, going in. So, uh, when we took a billion dollars of cost out, we knew that there was probably a couple of extra hundred million dollars in there that we were taking out that we would partially let fall through to the bottom line, especially if revenue came back and, and partially um, invest in growth. And so what's happened is our portfolio, if you think about it, tools, uh, outdoor, um, security and industrial, each element of our portfolio has benefited in terms of relevance. Uh, as a result of the pandemic and some of the challenges. So we already talked about e-commerce, 
uh, lawn and garden I referred to, but we have a two and a half billion dollar acquisition coming in the area of lawn and garden uh, outdoor power equipment. And we're going to take advantage, uh, we're buying a company called MTD. Uh, we have an option to do that in the middle of next year. And that, that company is a leader in um, lawn and garden outdoor power equipment in the United States. Uh, and we're gonna take the opportunity to electrify, uh, to begin the electrification of the lawn and garden industry, the, uh, the petrol part of it, uh, as well as bring our DeWalt brand to that business and then take it up market into the professional uh, channel where a lot of the money is made in lawn and garden. So we're excited about that. And then another one that came, came through is this societal obsession with health and safety. Uh, and our security business was what we like to say uh, uh, under evaluation for its strategic value to us. Uh, it's a $2 billion business. We, it, it's been very good business for us and for many years, but it doesn't really fit with the rest of the portfolio uh, intrinsically. However, this obsession with health and safety has elevated the importance of security and health. And if you think about the components of this business that we have, we have a healthcare business that developed applications in contact tracing and proximity sensing using IoT and, and artificial intelligence and so forth. We have an automatic door business, which are you know, the doors you see in a Home Depot or the grocery store or whatever, but that automatic door concept can now you know, be uh, transferred to all sorts of uh, smaller uh, type of doors, in, 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 indoor doors, including indoor outdoor doors. Uh, and then uh, the security business itself the core business, you know, people need to protect assets and people want to be safer. So it all has the portfolio itself, you know, has a growing relevance and, and uh, growth opportunity associated with it. And we add all those things together. It's about a three to four billion dollar growth opportunity over the next couple of years uh, on a uh, annualized basis. So I'm going to go back to the questions. Thank you. And, and, and we have a lot of questions, but I want to cover as much as possible and concisely. Both of you talked about e-commerce. It's impossible to talk about e-commerce without uttering the word Amazon. And, and so how does Amazon impact your thinking about direct-to-consumer and other forms of distribution? Jim, do you want to start? Well, I'll start by saying we love Amazon. You know, Amazon has been one of the great growth drivers of our business and we make decent money, uh, you know, uh, selling through them and where we have strong market share with Amazon we wouldn't think about direct to consumer, but so our direct to consumer is really focused on those geographies where we're under indexed in share, such as China and India and Germany, but, and, and we're going hard at direct to consumer there. And if, if at some point, uh, one of the uh, partners we have in B2B, B2B to C e-commerce decides that uh, we're no longer their partner or, or, or we do the same thing, there's always that D to C knowledge that we'll gain that we can transfer you know, into uh, the appropriate market at the appropriate time. Inon? Yeah, we, you know, I'd say very much the same. Uh, Amazon has been a great partner for, for Mattel, uh, an important growth driver. But I would expand that and say that we've been developing uh, our relationship with our retail partners uh, at this period more than ever. Uh, it's been, been really collaborative. There's no, there is no arm wrestling. Uh, it's very much a partnership with the retailers. And when you talk about e-commerce and, and, and online retail, you need to remember that the uh, traditional brick and mortar retailers also have online business, online sales. Target, business. Target Walmart. The, yeah. yeah, and Target and Walmart, as two examples, are doing excellent work um, and also uh, drive a lot of growth through their online retail and e-commerce business. So it became very much an omni-channel world. You need to find ways to reach the consumers wherever consumers are. This is our job. And with that, Amazon, as well as all other retailers are uh, crucial partners in able to, to do well. And the pandemic showed that we can work very well together and find ways to uh, cater for the uh, consumer, consumer, consumer demand that is out there in the marketplace. Yeah, and there's a, re a real parallel with Home Depot and Lowe's and Omnichannel with us too. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Pedro, for that question. And I'm also um, going to ask a question from um, one of our professors who talks about how have the tariffs and trade wars and trade agreements affected uh, this is from Professor Elahi. 
Um, how has it affected your business? Has it um, impeded any of the supply chain issues? Has it changed how you think about where you're gonna produce pricing, product pricing? So starting again with you, Jim, on that. Well, the, the concise answer, since I know you're driving con conciseness is, uh, and succinctness is all of the above. It's been, uh, it's been very disruptive and we've had to make in incredible uh, uh, supply chain moves, you know, and very quickly, and we've had to do use analytics to try to figure out how to make those what moves to make. Uh, and we've been lobbying like crazy for injustices such as in America, we pay tariffs on power tool components for power tools that we make in America. If our competitors make the power tools in China and ship them into America, they don't pay tariffs. And that's just completely wrong and unfair. And I'm looking forward to um, rekindling those conversations with the new administration because they, they went nowhere with the old administration. But short answer, incredibly disruptive. We worked through it uh, on all those fronts. And here we are today, you know, with uh, that kind of behind us for now. And we'll see what happens as we go forward. Uh, and I would say our biggest issue was about uh, in the thick of the trade war was the uncertainty. Uh, there was a period where it was hard to project where things would go and, and what, you know, how would you plan uh, your path forward. And this is where our job to design a flexible and, and responsive organization was more important uh, than ever. And, and this is how we're designing our supply chain to be able to respond to market changes. It could be tariffs today and another challenge tomorrow. What we need to do is to be able to move fast, respond, and, and react to market changes, uh, to challenges, as well as opportunities. And this is where we believe we sit today with a very flexible, robust supply chain organization that can take advantage of those situations or respond to uh, challenges down the road. Great. Can we shift gears a little bit? Um, both, both Mattel and Stanley Black & Decker have made uh, really big investments in corporate social responsibility. And, and you've been out in front of that issue uh, at both companies. So I wonder if you could just quickly share, you know, uh, why you're doing that, uh, what's behind the thinking, uh, and what are you hoping to achieve through your corporate social responsibility efforts? And again, we're, we're, we are a little short on time here, so just kind of briefly, but I think the students would be very interested in, in learning a little bit more about your perspective on that. So. Anand, why don't we start with you and uh, tell us a little bit about your, your firm and your thinking there. Yeah, we, we take our responsibility, uh, our role as a, co a global corporate citizen uh, uh, very importantly. We have a responsibility to our consumers, to the communities in which we operate, and do whatever we can to advance key priorities that we see as, as vital in today's world, such as diversity and inclusion, environmental sustainability, and supporting uh, uh, the communities in which we live, work, and play. Each of our brands is built on a purposeful play and is designed to deliver an intrinsic value that inspire, entertain, and develop children through play. And much of our success in, is grounded in ourselves being a richly diverse, uh, richly diverse company. We, uh, last year we made, uh, we announced our goal to achieve 100% recycled, recyclable or bio-based materials in both, uh, in, in both products and packaging in 2000, by 2030. We already launched product from Fisher Price and Mega that are made from sugarcane based plastics <laughs> as part of that commitment. And just recently announced that Uno uh, will have a new product called Uno Nothing But Paper, which is the first Uno deck that has removed cellophane from all of its packaging. So uh, this is one example for the type mm -hmm. of things that we do, but we also continue to work really hard in achieving other important priorities around pay equity or pay parity, increasing female and minority representation at all levels uh, of the organization at Mattel, and also doing our share in driving uh, those messages and values wherever we operate, wherever we are, and using and working with our brands to, to, uh, to deliver those mes messages to consumers all over the world. Great, thank, thank you. Jim, your thoughts on uh, CSR? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take it from a big picture perspective. 
uh, because I've done a lot of thinking even before I took the job about social responsibility and, and, and the purpose type driven corporations. And um, one of the things that I realized it's pretty obvious, you know, is that big government, government in general is just not getting the job done on some of the, uh, many of the big issues that we face today and many of the small ones too. Um, but it, whether it's inequality or, you know, climate, you know, whatever uh, you might want to cite, uh, government can't seem to get its act together. And so I do believe that corporations do have the responsibility to do what they can to help governments and to help society kind of tackle some of these problems. And if we do it in partnership uh, with governments and, and uh, the private sector, I think we have a chance. I mean, companies can move far faster. They're more agile. They have, in many cases, are able to mobilize their resources. And when you take uh, an organization like the Business Roundtable and you get all these uh, you know, CEOs together uh, and, and pursue objectives on a, on a united basis, you know, we're starting to see that be a, a really a great forcing function uh, as we go forward. And I also, from a capitalism point of view, I'm a big believer in capitalism, but I also believe that, uh, I believe in stakeholder capitalism, that if we don't uh, make sure we take care of all the stakeholders, capitalism is surely going to become extinct. So there's a, a growing need for us to worry more than, more about more than just profits, but to worry about our stakeholders as well. And you're seeing that in statements from the, the business roundtable on the purpose-driven corporation. And we're seeing a real uh, transformation going on. And I know there's skepticism on uh, parts of some people, but I can tell you it is palpable. It is real in the business community. And it's a very exciting time, especially with a new administration coming in, who I think is going to be a lot, um, a lot more focused on some of these big issues of the day. Let me ask each of you a different question, if you don't mind. Um, so Inan, uh, you spoke about intellectual property, you spoke about um, products that are going more heavily digital uh, in toys. There's also a question here about the concern that kids are becoming too obsessed with their digital devices. So how do you, how do you balance that? It goes right to the heart of what I said earlier, that um, people now recognize the importance of, of physical play. Um, that is, is, a, is a way, a form of driving innovation, uh, cognitive behavior, um, and, and overall making people more rounded, making kids more rounded. And we have, um, as part of our mission, is to create innovative products and experiences that inspire, entertain, and develop children through play. With, uh, with a very clear, uh, a very clear purpose, which to, is to empower the next generation to explore the wonder of childhood and reach the full potential. And as we think about this, you know, the purpose and the mission coming together, it is doing what we can to, to design product that, that add value, that, that have a purpose that enriches, uh, enrich kids' lives. And with that, um, is this is how we shape our thinking. I would say, you know, we're not oblivious to the fact that kids spend increasingly more time in front of screens. And as the owner of the IP, we also have opportunities to be uh, in front of them there as well. But with that said, we're a company that at the heart is a toy company. We create physical product. We do it really well. We do it with a purpose. We do it with a mission. And we try to find the right balance in, in having, being a commercial enterprise, achieving our business objectives, but at the same time, doing the right thing by our consumers, by families, by parents. And if you can do that, find the right balance, then, then uh, you're, in the, you're in, 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 on the right side of, um, of the equation. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna ask you, Jim, a question that would probably take you an hour to answer, but you don't have an hour. <laughs> um, how, how when, when the COVID crisis started and you thought about your role as the leader of this global big corporation, I mean, you, you are a very well seasoned leader, but did you think differently about the leadership imperative upon you 
at this moment in time? Were there things that you said, I have got to do to keep this company, to keep this community together? Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I one of my favorite thoughts, you know, that I, uh, that ran through my mind is I, and I still, it still does today, but, you know, after um, 41 years of leadership training and experience with major corporations, I felt like, I was the right person to lead the company at this time. And I, I trained for it all my, I trained for it all my life is kind of how I thought about it. So that gave me great confidence to um, be instinctual in terms of knowing what to do. Uh, and yes, there was definitely some, some uh, modification of leadership style and some, uh, some challenges that, you know, I rose to meet in different ways. And uh, I think one of the most important things though was defining early on safety, you know, the safety of our employees as, as the number one priority. So we would do things like, um, you know, we implemented PPE right up front, you know, and, and all the social distancing and all those protocols across the company. Um, but I was very decisive, I think, in the early days. Um, and yet I involved my team in a much bigger way. So in the past, our executive committee was 12 people. I increased it to about 45 people uh, on a weekly basis. So we went to a weekly rhythm. So everybody in that top echelon of leadership knew what they, what, where we were going for that next period of time, what their, their role was. And, and so it was a very inclusive uh, form of, of being decisive and, and somewhat directive. Um, and uh, it was a special blend um, because literally things were changing by the by the you know the hour and we also formed a senior risk committee which because risks were coming at us that we never anticipated before at, at a very fast pace uh, and so this risk committee would deal with those risks um, as they as they came and we tried to anticipate some of the you know that uh, hadn't arrived yet like what would what would we do when the first person died you know then and we've had 11 deaths none of which were caused in our plants or facilities but We've had 11 employees, 11 associates die out of 60,000. Now that's 11 you know, lives that were lost. So anyway, it's been, a, I guess the last thing I would say, it's just been a time when uh, empathy and humility have been very important too. The ability to connect with people on an emotional level and because people have never worked harder and they've never felt more disconnected. And so, you know, that, that, that style of leadership. And I, I guess the last thing I would say is you have to evolve your leadership style based on the conditions that you're operating with. And that's one of the lessons I learned over many years. And so that's exactly how we evolved. And as I evolved, my, my team evolved as well. So the last question is yours, Matt. So just since we only have a couple of minutes, one minute each, I guess, <laughs> um, tell us why, we're, why should a QU graduate come to work for your company? And Inan, why don't we start with you? Well, I can tell you about me. I feel privileged every day um, working at Mattel, a company that has such impact on, on the, worlds of, of, uh, the world around us, on kids, and help shape the future. Help, you know, we shape uh, the way tomorrow would look like. Um, and when you work in such a, an important company with such great brands, when you're surrounded by innovative people, great culture, and able to actually make a difference, that's, um, that's inspiring. Uh, so I'm inspired every day uh, being at Mattel by the people, by the company, by our product and assets, and by the people we work with outside the company. Um, it is a privilege. I mean, I could, I could say the same thing and I would echo you know, what uh, Inan said. I would also say that this combination of financial performance, which means if you own stock in the company, you're probably going to, to uh, uh, increase your wealth. Uh, that's one thing. A lot of people not high in the priority list. Some people it is. But the innovation ecosystem that we've created and the focus on innovation makes it exciting. And this uh, focus on social responsibility is really fulfilling. And, and the combination of those three things leads to an incredibly uh, high level of engagement and, and inspiration, similar to what Inan was talking about. Great. Okay, so here's the last 30 second question. If you had to put two Mattel and two Stanley Black & Decker items in your stocking stuffer for Christmas, what two would they be? Jim. 
Well, for the thriftier of the, of the people, uh, there's this wonderful uh, two-pack of Stanley Fat Max tapes, and it's only $14.99. So if you're on a college student's budget, that might be a great way to, to fill a stocking, or at least put a little dent in it. Uh, for those folks that have much bigger stockings, we have these incredible uh, DeWalt 12-volt extreme tools, which are the 12-volt tools that have the power of a 20-volt tool, and they're they're running at Home Depot and Lowe's, at, and are running at Lowe's, I guess, at $99 each. Home Depot has a 20 volts equivalent, which is a little more expensive, but uh, that is a really innovative and uh, very powerful uh, set of uh, tools. Okay, in on two items. Well, I, I you know, I, you can't expect me to choose just two when we have a portfolio. <laughs> you have to, product. two, two. But, but uh, okay, pick the Barbie color reveal, great innovation, just incredible product that is doing so well and is always fun to play with. And Hot Wheels Ultimate Garage, which is a great product, yet another uh, you know, amazing uh, opportunity to, to have fun and challenge yourself every day. Uh, thank you both. This, we could have done this for another couple of hours here and our students would have liked that too, based on all of the questions. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for leading purpose-driven companies. Uh, Jim, thank you for being such a champion of, of Connecticut and Inan for bringing such joy to the world. Uh, thank you both. And Matt, it was fun. Yep, thanks was to all great. Of you. Thank you both thank so you. much. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.